this has very short lines, so it goes through real quick. But we anthroposophists can appreciate where this is coming from. I don't know to what extent he's acquainted with Steiner at all. This title of this poem is What to Remember When Waking. In that first hardly noticed moment in which you wake, Coming back to this life from the other, more secret, movable and frighteningly honest world where everything began, there's a small opening into the day which closes the moment you begin your plans. <laughs> <laughs> What you can plan is too small for you to live. What you can live wholeheartedly will make plans enough for the vitality hidden in your sleep. Mm. To be human is to become visible while carrying what is hidden as a gift to others. Mm. To remember the other world in this world is to live in your true inheritance. You're not a troubled guest on this earth. That's a, a thing from Faust from, from Goethe. You're not a troubled guest on this earth. And you're not an accident amidst other accidents. You are invited from another and greater night than the one from which you have just emerged. That's a hard one to read. I'll try again. You are not a troubled guest on this earth. You are not an accident amidst other accidents. You were invited from another and greater night than the one from which you have just emerged. Now, looking through the slanting light of the morning window toward the mountain presence of everything that can be, what urgency calls you to your one love? What shape waits in the seed of you to grow and spread its branches against a future sky? Is it waiting in the fertile sea? In the trees beyond the house? In the life you can imagine for yourself? In the open and lovely white page on the waiting desk? It works, and you wonder, is this an process? But it doesn't have to be. A poet speaks from where we're coming from anyway. So, the poem at the end. So we've worked out something during the break, and I think it's Mary's turn to energize us with something that occurred to her with those two verses we were working on. Yes, and the poem addresses it quite nicely, that moment from sleeping to waking, which seems to be taking place around the time of the well, equinox. But also in the verses, you can see this turning that begins to happen. And what I bolted forward to tell Herbert was that he was really drawing <laughs> images of the zodiac here himself. <laughs> <laughs> And I share that by way of suggesting that we don't want to get stuck on form or in dates. Mm -hmm. And this idea that there is a mood that is delivered through the, or experienced through the verses, is meant to, in my understanding of it, strengthen us and give us the courage to find the mood, not only of ourselves, but the cycle of the year, and then the way to participate in that mood is facilitated by the verses and by the images, by practicing the virtues or the Lord's prayers. That these things are facilitators of our becoming in, in harmony. Um, Rudolf Steiner does say, my most favorite quote, is that the more abundantly the harmony of the cosmos fills the soul, the more peace and harmony there will be on the earth. Mm -hmm. And I regard all of these as opportunities for harmonizing in that rhythm because through him they were coming out of this 
understanding of the rhythm of the cosmos. So in the, the verse that was, this is craft, this is 52. Yeah, so strength. it's, a, it's the, the last verse. And I, I think I, I also would just like to speak to the fact that there are never 52 weeks from one Easter to the next. Mm -hmm. And that this is something that has to be wrestled with. And although I am, through the years, have been deeply grateful to Herbert for sorting that out for me <laughs> <laughs> and for us, mm -hmm. that there is something to that process of finding out where do we lengthen or shorten in the cycle of the year. Because sometimes there are more than 52 weeks and sometimes there are less. There are never 52 <coughs> weeks. And what Rudolf Steiner says about this is that the society can expect to be derided by this because it's a calendar that's not fixed and it has to be recreated every year. Mm -hmm. But that in something that is fixed, there are the forces of death. And that this the calendar intends to be a force of life, mm -hmm. something that brings life to us. So as we go through the cycle of the year and assign the verses, always beginning on a Sunday, I do that as well. With each verse, there is this question, where do I lengthen and shorten? And that's a conversation I need to have with Herbert too, more <laughs> intensely. Shall we argue in front of them? <laughs> we don't even argue in front of them. <laughs> just the parents argue in front of the kids. <laughs> I don't know that it's an argument, it's more of a no. kind of a, how do, you, how do you do that, where do we lengthen and shorten? And can we find it in the, in the do we have enough courage to find it in the cycle of the year and say, ah, oh, the mood has changed. The verse didn't change yet, but the mood has changed. And are we aware enough that that is happening? So Herbert was very diplomatic in saying to me, well, you know, you can't show all 12 images. <laughs> Will, yeah, eventually, but we'll look right now at the image in the calendar of the soul that represents Pisces and then Aries. Mm -hmm. So this We're is going to leave this aside two sheets. Them. There are two sheets to work with here. This is the third sheet. I mean, well, you'll see it. So, plenty for everybody. Just pass and around. Easter, anyway, is always changing, so it's already a, a living calendar. Yes, and we, we did speak about that last mm -hmm. night, about the mm -hmm. moving nature of the mm -hmm. Easter festival, mm -hmm. and why that keeps us awake. It's the only date that's changing, right, within our year. Well, the a Ash Wednesday moves right. with that as right. well. Yeah. But then, and we had a conversation I and I did yesterday about the 26th week after the vernal full moon, which would be, is the so harvest is moon. The other yeah, the harvest moon. And the Michaelmas verse really needs to happen. Oh, after the moon. But I, 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 I whispered it from this. We really haven't sorted that out. And it's, it's research that we have. Yeah. What is it that's being expressed in the verse that represents? or is speaking to what's happening in the cosmos. And at least with regard to the moon, because Easter is a date that can only happen after you find the relationship between sun and moon after the vernal equinox. And that harvest moon is also 26 weeks after the vernal full moon. And it's the moon that's either before, closest to autumn equinox, but sometimes it's before and sometimes it's after. And the moon, the mood in that time of year, uh, and here I am discussing what I discussed with Herbert, was that when that moon becomes full before autumn equinox, then it means it's above the celestial equator and it's as though the forces are strong. Or no, it's below the celestial equator still. So this force, the lunar forces are not as strong as they are when that moon comes full after vernal equinox. So my question was, is the task harder or does it require greater myelic strength to deal with the full moon when it's immediately after the equinox. So it, it's, it's a question that's mm. But to bring us back to this time of year and to the Easter time and to this movement that's happening between Pisces and Aries. And I just have to see. So Pisces is this. Oh, okay. Pisces is this image on the top left. Circles. I have a copy of this. This is a picture taken of this image etched in glass. 
And I'll mm. explain, if you've been to the Steiner House in Ann Arbor, these are hanging on the wall when you walk into the lobby. It's on the left side. Has anyone seen that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So these, these images were etched in glass by Margot Rosler, who in the 1930s took up the work of Ima von Eckenstein, who was the contemporary of Rudolf Steiner, that originally worked with the images in the calendar, as you were describing earlier. Where did we put the picture? Yeah. Yeah. So, so Margot Rosler took up this work and made it her life's work and uh, eventually moved into working with glass as an appropriate medium because through the glass you could have the experience of the color of the images streaming toward us from the zodiac. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to give you a brief history, in 1999 when my son was in the first grade at the Ann Arbor, uh, Rudolph Stein School in Ann Arbor, I got a call from his teacher and she said, well, I have these things in the trunk of my car that maybe you know what they are. <laughs> I said, well, I, originally I thought they were from Emma Van Eckerstein. <laughs> you have them in the trunk of your car? <laughs> and uh, so I went and got them, and they were, uh, they were custom-made wooden frames for them, and I actually took them to an art auctioner in Detroit to have them appraised as a work of art and had to explain some of the history of where they came from, but just, just so that we could determine how to have them insured, and then began this process 13 years ago now of trying to figure out what to do with them. And I originally had the ideal that we would engage with the University of Michigan Museum of Art and create an exhibit out of artwork and art forms that are inspired by the zodiac. So I'm not really talking about anthroposophy. Showing up with this artwork is a demonstration of what I meant. And then, oh, by the way, there's this movement and their speech and all of these things that come out of anthroposophy that really relate to or, or our expression of the understanding of our relationship to the zodiac it's still in its seed form <laughs> finally i'm here with together with herbert doing a, a presentation so this has been a long time coming so this is a picture of the image etched in glass so glass is a different medium than what is expressed in this black and white image that you have here. But as it's described by Rudolf Steiner, this image, or Pisces, typically we think of Pisces as the fishes. The Pisces can also represent two footprints. One footprint in the physical world and the other stepping into the spiritual. And in the traditional understanding of the zodiac, Pisces is the 12th sign. So it's the culminating place. And so to find one's feet and to really be both on the world and conscious of being in the spiritual world, of being a spiritual being in the physical world. Um, and this, these two images, so this is Aries below it with the two faces, from my head to my feet, um, an image of God. And what lives behind this is the understanding that the forces of the zodiac do not stream toward us all the same way. Rudolf Steiner describes it that the forces of the zodiac stream toward the human being on the earth and are transformed by our activity and then become ascending forces. And in our time, there are seven signs that have been ascended. Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, and Libra. If you want, I can later go more specifically to the relationship of the zodiac with the parts of the body. But from Libra, from Aries to Libra, these forces have already been ascended in the human being. What the forces that are still descending are Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces. But in the image painted by Raphael of the Transfiguration, where it's often shown, you see just the detail of the Christ figure. And Rudolf Steiner says, pay attention, even the position of the feet are very important. And it suggests this Pisces idea of being like footprints. One that's in the physical world and one stepping into the spiritual world. Then just to, by way of describing, this is, is the Aries image in glass. It's not as easily seen that what Ima von Eckerdstein was trying to express through Aries, we have the experience that the light of the world, or the light of the sun, is what illuminates the physical world for us. And at the time 
of the spring equinox when the sun is moving into the constellation of Aries, we are having a greater experience of sunlight. When the verse, how does the verse say that? When out of worldwide spaces, the sun speaks to the human mind. So this is the sunlight. It's coming toward us from above the celestial equator, and we can see into the world. The other face is meant to indicate that when we look into the spiritual world, what illuminates that world is our own inner light. So there is this, you could call it a duality happening between these two signs, the two footprints in Pisces, and then the two images of the human being, one looking into the physical world and one looking into the spiritual world. The physical world illuminated by the light of the sun, which is returned north of the celestial equator, and the other illuminated by the light of our own striving. What's expressed in the images moving from Aries all the way through to Pisces, at least as, as the way Margot Rosler has described it, and she tried to further on the intentions of Ima von Eckenstein, is that through each constellation of the zodiac, we are receiving the inspiration or the impulses for developing the bodily sheaths to receive the ego. And Herbert has been sharing this, that this is, we could consider it a chalice that we're crafting to receive the egoic forces. Now, during the time of um, when Rudolf Steiner was working with Ima von Eckenstein on these images, they would be during the holy nights season from Christmas <coughs> Eve to Epiphany. The artists would begin the task of recreating these images in art. And that by this means, it was as though weaving together a basket through which we could prepare ourselves to receive the spiritual fruits that are ripening in the coming year. So Rudolf Steiner says that every year there are spiritual fruits, and then if we don't receive, we don't prepare to receive them, they fall to the earth and they rot. So we have to prepare ourselves for receiving this, and one of the ways to do this is working with the zodiac, particularly with these new images, which are not, um, they're not symbols. Last night I showed you the symbols. These were the traditional glyphs, and it's interesting, of all 88 recognized constellations in the night sky, there are only 12 that have achieved symbol status. It's the 12 that belong to the zodiac. There's no symbol for the constellation Cygnus, or no recognized symbol for the constellation Orion. You can say that you recognize the pattern that the stars make, but there's no symbol that's universally accepted by humanity to represent the constellations outside of the zodiac. These images are not intended to be symbols. The time of using symbols to represent the spiritual world to ourselves is past, because now we are striving for direct encounter so this is to facilitate an experience. And because of that, I think we need to remain uh, malleable or permeable, as with the verses. And what helps us in that is that the day of Easter is moving every year. So we're having a different relationship with it. Was it last year that April was on the 23rd? The 24th? It was late. It was really late. In the tropical zodiac, the sun was already in Taurus. So there's a totally different mood than being in Aries or being earlier. And then if you, I'm not going to go into the difference, the sidereal and the tropical zodiac pose quite a different contemplation of this. When you look at the, for clarification's sake, I'd like to say, in the original calendar of the soul, the images for the sun, which these depict, were included on the pages according to the sun's position among the stars in what's referred to as the sidereal zodiac. So the stars that it actually appears among. The images that were created for the moon that occur in the calendar were positioned according to the tropical zodiac, which is not the position that it appears to be in. And there is some confusion around this. Mm -hmm. But what it creates for me is an opportunity for you to say, OK, I get to work with it. I get to try to understand what does that mean to me. And we had, we had a conversation with Joe this morning that I'm sure for him is quite unfulfilled <laughs> about why does the one matter. And why it matters to me is that we have to create a place, we have to fix a place so that we can 
think about it, and from that place then begin to move things. And ideally, I think what I'd love to be able to look forward to after this weekend is that we can have a sense that each of us has an inner picture of the cycle of the year, whether it's spatially or in the feeling like, that we all of us have an image of our the cycle of the year, our planetary system, where things are relative to one another without knowing astronomy, without being an astrologer or an astrosopher, we have a sense of where things are. And that we, when we awaken that sense in ourselves, then we can begin to move things around. And it requires finding your feet, Pisces, first. So the movement here that I was explaining, what I saw in what Herbert had drawn here, was that this, with, um, it's perhaps more visible in the, what I call the Aries verse, and I have to get my book because I don't have it by heart. Oh, good. We'll match up what they have yes. the So when out of worldwide spaces the sun speaks to the human mind, and gladness from the depths of soul becomes in the seal, one with light. Then, rising from the sheath of self, thoughts soar to distances of space, and dimly bind the human beings, the, excuse me, I take one, the human being to the spirit's life. For me, what I see in that is the traditional voice of the spirits, bringing forth and then binding. It's something that's trying to become. So it's rising up. And last night I described this when we went through the traditional glyphs of the zodiac. It's this, this rising up. In Pisces, now, what we see in the 52nd verse, when from the depths of soul the spirit, the spirit turns to the life of worlds and beauty wells from wide expanses, then out of heaven's distance, there's still a streaming in, as Herbert was talking about, as opposed to the streaming up. Streams life strength into human bodies, uniting by its mighty energy, the spirit's being with our human life. So I see in that this spirit being with the human life that's united by these forces. This is the image of Pisces. So I don't want us to get stuck on that, but I'm trying to demonstrate that in these, this language, this is speaking of an image or an impression that's being made by the cosmos on the human being throughout the cycle of the year. Now, how to apply this idea that there's footsteps going on here? We have to really kind of think about what, what, is, what is this? He didn't use this image in the calendar. And nor did he use that image. So there are multiple ways to approach it. And I, I hope that I'm not making it too confusing. What I intend is to kind of encourage us, to give courage to say, there's this way, and there's this way, and it's all all right, and I can live with it and sort it out through the cycle of the year and use what Herbert's giving me about how to apply the verses in the cycle of the year because you have a, a very um, strong relationship to which verses belong to which point in the cycle of the year. And where are the breathing moments where I would lengthen or shorten? Is it between Easter and St. John's? Is it from St. John's to, to the next festival? Well, when we Is pass it cross the quarter days, days? You know, yeah. I do it. <coughs> First of all, with Easter, mm -hmm. you need to stick with the, well, you need to. Here right, we well, go. it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> I like sticking to the verses that lead up to Whitson. Because when you get to that eighth verse on the Sunday of Whitson, to me, that's a Whitson verse. Mm -hmm. Then you have to realize, now, from Whitson to St. John's, mm -hmm is do I need to make an adjustment? Next year, you don't. It just happens that the verses flow from Whitson to St. John's, and the St. John's mood is on St. John's. Mm -hmm. 
in this edition, 1912 to 1913, every verse begins, new verse begins on a Sunday, mm -hmm. except one. Except one. So even here, there's a life at work. Yes. And it is the St. John's verse. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what happened that year. St. John's is on June 24th. So in the year 1912, St. John's was on a Monday. So when you go back to the dates that you're supposed to be using the verses, they're given here. All the dates begin on a Sunday, except that one. And St. John's verse is verse number 12, and you have it on your chart there. So, instead of beginning the St. John's mood on Sunday, June 23rd, the verse of the previous week is still going, and the verse starts on Monday of June 24th. So that is the only exception where here, the indication of the date given is you start that verse on the mood of Monday. Mm -hmm. But from year to year, this you, you make decisions yourself. Right. Right. And my, I'm just wondering to what extent Steiner himself was involved. Mm -hmm. You know, with his traveling and his lecturing, mm -hmm. did he really proofread? everything that his co-workers were putting together and publishing. Because what happened in 1912 to 1913? Where did Easter fall in 1913? The 52 verses go through. Yeah. Easter fell two or three weeks before the 52nd verse. And all the calendar here does is to just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so, you you have a date for let's see how it works here. Hang on a sec. So marvelous to be working with the original here. It's great. But <clears throat> so what do you have? It just keeps going. So verse fifty two starts on March thirtieth of nineteen thirteen, and Easter. I looked that up. Oh, it's, it is, it flows through here. Sorry. Easter was on March 23rd. Mm -hmm. And yet the 52nd verse here is dated for March 30th. So it's it kind of, it's like a train going through the train stop. <clears throat> and so for that, what I do in order to be in sync with Easter and have the 51st verse or 52nd verse going the week before Easter, I make the adjustment between Epiphany and the week of Ash Wednesday. Since Ash Wednesday is a fixed seven weeks leading up to Easter, to me, the seven verses are the very verses of the verses after Easter, leading to Whitson, who have the same dynamic of preparation to receive Easter leading up. So that's what I do from Epiphany to that, that's when I do my little adjustment. Yeah. And the adjustment is different every year. Mm -hmm. Which verses do I want to double up? Maybe do two verses in one week? That's just a method. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's another method where it says you can do a verse for four days, another verse for eight days, you know, this expansion and traction. I think that violates the seven-day practice mm -hmm. of the rhythm of the astral. But maybe it's a violation that's allowable. I think I, I just yeah. I also this is the feel that discussion. it's something that we, we have to work with. Yeah. So that we can what find the, the mood. What's the mood in the verse, but also what's the mood in in you know, experience of the world at that time. And there are these other components of the calendar that when we're working with the verses now we're not necessarily using the images of the zodiac, as well as the, as well as the, uh, the dates, the feast days, and the significant uh, historic figures. 
there's three elements there, and we typically are only working with one. And so part of this initiative